to the August 7th meeting of the Community Resource Committee of the Amherst Town Council. So we do have a quorum, so we have four out of our five members present. So our agenda today is, I think it's public comment, then we're gonna discuss the, the syllabus or the informational topics, then we're gonna discuss the master plan, then we're gonna discuss the dog park, Yeah, um, okay. And then we're other business, 48 hours. Yep. I was wondering if, given that the discussion of the master plan is going to be ongoing through several meetings, whether or not we could get to the dog park sooner. Yeah, well, we have to have the dog park advocate here, and Chris is on the way. Is that all right? In the meantime, we can see if there's any public comment. And I also think there needs to be a public thank you, or CRC public thank you to General Accolade. for the chair point. Thank, thank you so I much. I did one little thing, she did everything. No, else. thank you so much. No worries. So we're going to go out of order and we're going to go right to the dog park. You're on the air. Oh, um, we need a minute to take this. He did the last yeah. two meetings. It's recorded onto YouTube, onto the YouTube site, but it takes for it, it's really hard for the it take, it's really hard for the staff to upload it. Yeah, yeah. Hello, okay, it's on now. Hi, I'm Nate Malloy, I'm a planner with the town, and I'm here to talk about the dog park. The, uh, you know, Dave Zomack presented to the council and they referred it here. The, um, you know, there's uh, some work going on in the right of way. So if we walk through the packet, there's one, just the location of the park. So, you know, there's been a dog park task force that had been meeting for quite a while and they centered on this property um, off old Bolster Town Road, it's the old the old landfill and it's the area in the red circle so it's about it's a little over an acre it's an acre and a half park it's in an area that used to be I guess the stump dump so there's not as much danger of anything under the soil uh, in the larger packet there's a colored rendering it's not the final rendering of the park but it's, it's pretty close to it so it shows that there's two sections of the park there's a small dog area and a large dog area and you know, there's parking along the street with one central opening in the middle, one central entry, and then, you know, it splits off into the two dog areas. The, the, the request right now uh, that staff is making is the, as you can see in the rendering, the parking and some of the improvements are within the right of way. So if you, um, you know, look through to the third page, there's the final design with a solid red line. And that, shows the right-of-way line, the property line. And so the design was finalized before it was clear exactly where the right-of-way um, line was located. Yeah. And the, uh, in, in some of it is, you know, the rest of the landfill is actually considered prime habitat for the endangered, um, for the grasshopper sparrow. So the location of the park is such that we're trying to reduce the visibility of the birds while they're nesting uh, and you know, still have a park there. And so the request is to allow, you know, within the public right of way, some improvements. So, you know, allow pull-in parking, uh, you know, change in location of sidewalk, 
you know, anything that's built as part of the park in terms of fencing and other things will be pulled onto the property. But, you know, right now, uh, it's a pretty wide road and there's, you know, cars could pull up on the side, but we're proposing this formal 20 car parking lot. You know, there'll be, there'll be some bike racks and it's a daytime use only. So there's no, there's no lighting, uh, you know, staff can lock the gate. So there isn't any anticipation that this would be used after, you know, during, after daylight hours and it would be um, open seasonally. So during the winter, it, depending on the snow or the, the conditions, it wouldn't be open either then. So there wouldn't be any reason to plow the spaces so during the winter. Open in the uh, that's, it, it's been discussed. It hasn't been totally decided. More than likely it'll, um, it'll close, um, but, but it could be open, you know, if there's n not a lot of snow and depending on how, if it's seasonally warm into November, December, it could remain open. And then at some point it would close. And I, 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 you know, I don't know if anyone else has questions. I mean, you know, Berkshire Design worked on this. The, you know, we're anticipating that, um, you know, we're providing ample parking. So there isn't, you know, the trip generation shows a lot fewer, something like four to six cars. Um, it, there's, the standards haven't really been developed for what a dog park would, you know, how many people actually would go to a dog park in terms of compared to like a regular recreation facility, but we're anticipating that there's sufficient parking and bike racks and there's enough neighbors that they can walk, but there is, you know, the need to have some vehicle parking here. If you look at Amethyst Brook, you can see how many cars park there now. And, you know, the idea is that some of those may be, users may be coming here with their dogs. Amethyst Brook will be more fun than this park. <laughs> it is more fun <laughs> for a dog. <laughs> yeah, there are different types of um, fun. So this, you know, here the dogs are, you know, they're gonna socialize, the owners, right, the owners will socialize, it's a. And I guess if you're lucky enough to take your dog on a bus, like if it's a service dog, there's a bus stop right there. Bus. Right. The number 30. Yeah, uh, you know, the two site visits I've had, I've also thought like, oh geez, do people walk here? But the, both times I've been out there, there've been neighbors walking with their dogs on the street. So I'm thinking, oh, they're probably likely candidates yeah, yeah. to. Yeah. Um, Chris, you had your hand up. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Brester, Planning Director. I just wanted to make sure that you knew that what you are being asked to look at is what's going on in the town right-of-way. I don't have an agenda in front of me, so I don't know exactly how this is expressed, but the, um, the park as a whole has been reviewed by the Planning Board, and the Planning Board approved it. Um, I think it was in June. We haven't written up the decision yet, but um, it was approved in June, and the Town Council is being asked to look at what is being proposed in the town right of way. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, and the Conservation Commission also reviewed it because there were some wetlands, you know, nearby, and so they they approved it. Um, you know, and the design has been is responded to both Planning Board concerns and Conservation Commission. It's also working with Natural Heritage, so the you know the fence posts are going to be on ballast, so they can't puncture the landfill cap, and so you know there's fill being brought in because the dogs can't dig down. You know, we don't want to keep have them dig down to the cap. So the design responds to a lot of different conditions that are on the site and what you know has to work for a dog park. Andy. Yeah, so I actually had three questions, but I think Chris answered one of them already, which is that the uh, limitation, as I understood the request, is for the part of the uh, right of way that it needs to be added for parking right. um, spaces, and that is really what the council action needs to be because we are the keepers of the uh, public way, formerly a function of the select board, which is why I'm conscious, conscious of that. The second question that I had was is that, if I understand this correctly, um, well, you mentioned people can walk to it. In fact, um, isn't Part of it going to be fenced off so that people walking from Wildflower, that corner, really can't get through because it will be fenced off to protect the um, sparrows? Oh, you mean the, so the entire property will then be fenced off. There'll be a perimeter trail, you know, on, on top of the old landfill, but, the, you know, the dog park itself, right, has a perimeter fence and there's only the one entry gate on Old, Belch, old Belchertown Road. 
but you know, you, the idea is right now if people walk, you know, across what you know is the old landfill on the field, that won't be able to happen anymore. So the idea is that they would have to either walk along the perimeter of the fence or you know walk on the streets to get there. Is that is that what you're asking? Yeah. And the, the fence perimeter that I let me see if I there are, are there two fence perimeters, one around the dog park and another around. Um, portion of the old landfill that we now need to protect because of the um, yes the grasshopper sparrow grasshopper right sparrow. so if we went to the first map I showed you you know there's the outline in yellow of the whole property and then the red circle is the dog park so there really would be you know the fence I'm not sure it's going to follow this the whole it's not going to follow this outline of the property but there would be a perimeter fence around some of it and then you know a fence around the dog park yeah I just don't want to uh um, create impressions for neighbors so that walking to it is something that's going to be easy oh, to do. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess I was thinking they would just, you know, through lark Larkspur they would walk. It wouldn't be something that they could informally walk through. I mean, I still think the trail is still going to be connected. The trail that goes through would still be through and it would just be on the perimeter of the fence. So they wouldn't, you know, that's still available. And, uh, in the drawing that's the color drawing, mm -hmm. um, in, the, in several areas in the dog park, there are little blue things. Um, what are they? Are they the shade structures or are they something else? No, so in the dog park, there's, you know, with, when you enter it, there's the paved area. So there's a kind of an entry vestibule where someone, you know, there's two sets of gates. So if someone has a dog, they can transition between leash and off leash and then enter either area. And then there's, you know, paved pathways. And then the shade structures are in the yellow and blue. And then there's pea stone within the, within the walkway. So, you know, that's, you know, there's one surface treatment there. And then there's the grass area. And in the grass area, those blue or purple things are actually rocks or boulders. It's something that dogs can climb on. You know, they wouldn't be, you know, it's just some element that they can use for, for playing. So they'd be, you know, set in the ground. Anyone else? Right, and so I think in terms of the right of way, you know, as you can see, there is, you know, going to be formal parking. So there's, you know, it'll be a permanent, you know, essentially nose in parking within the right of way. You know, there's an existing hydrant that I think can remain. Um, you know, the, there's proposed to have some tree plantings within the right of way. And then the new sidewalk will, right now, the sidewalk kind of straddles the property line and it will in the new plan too. So it'll be a newer sidewalk that, you know, is in front of the parking. So if I were a UMass employee coming from Belchertown, I would park there and take the number 30 bus every 15 minutes, four stops to UMass, five stops to UMass. So I guess it'll be signed or? Good point. It was, it, yeah, we can sign it. I'm or meters. <laughs> sign. That's an it's yeah, actually, it's a good point because I think that there's been some concern over time that people are parking at Amethyst and then taking the bus right. in from Amethyst too. Um, and uh, actually, I'm not an advocate for metering because no, I'm not yeah. trying to make this hard on uh, people we want to use it, but, um, but you know, whether right. um, appropriate signage for both areas. Uh, and I think that the uh, Amethyst parking area is under the control of the Conservation Commission. So they're the, need, the ones who need to monitor parking there and see if they feel that there's a need. But uh, if this were to uh, happen uh, for reasons that you've j uh, just, just, the chair has just described, I do think that we would have to consider uh, parking restrictions on those spaces because they are in the public way. Right. No, I think that's, yeah, I think, you know, there could be time limits. I mean, there, you know, there's an expected average length of stay at a dog park, you know, so I don't think it's any more than an hour, you know, so there, you know, you could have, you know, some time limits that could be somehow enforced. I mean, the idea is that there will be friends of the dog park that may be, you know, some self-policing and neighborhood policing, um, you know, but yeah, maybe if there's that one car that's parked there every day for eight hours, it's at least noticeable. 
Any other questions or comments? Does anyone want to make a motion? Do we have the specific proposal that is before the council that will need voting that we are therefore recommending? I don't have any language. I didn't. Need, I didn't see it either in the in their previous packet. Right. You know, is it, you know, is, you know, as a, right, as the, now these are, you know, permanent improvements or changes in the public right of way, is that something that, you know. So the motion is to look for who? I'm looking at the, uh, this uh, meeting packet. Who was it the most recent meeting? The 22nd of July. It's a. Uh, is the parking entirely in the Belcher Town, Old Belcher Town Road right of way? No, if you look on the, um, the sheet L2 with the red, solid red line, you can see that half of it is. I see. The red line is the. Yeah, is the, is the property line. Okay. So as it exists now, you know, the, the edge of curb is on the previous sheet, you can see where the existing conditions. And so. Lots of red lines. The dotted red line yeah, on, yeah. on L1 shows where the existing condition. So right now the roadway is a little narrower and there's a sidewalk, you know, just, you know, outside, you know, within the right of way. And so now that, you know, that sidewalk's being shifted basically, you know, to the other side of the property line. I, I don't have. I don't. I'm looking at what was easily findable in the packet for the last. I was looking at what was most easily findable for the packet of the last meeting, which was um, item 7B on the agenda dog park plans. And it has the, uh, two of the maps that we just saw, but I don't see the language that we are. Um, yeah, I didn't see being that. asked to support, it's kind of hard to vote to recommend um, action when we don't have the action before us that we're being asked to recommend. So here's a possible solution. We're only advisory to the town council, so our vote is not a, it's not a binding vote, it's just a recommendation. So we can certainly indicate our support for the, the dog park right. and indicate our support for the use of the right of way as shown on the survey. And, and then the, by the time we actually vote on this at town council, then hopefully we'll have that language. Right, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I was ever presented any language either, you know, specifically what, you know, other than changes to the right of way, you know, I think you can say as in accordance with these plans. And yeah. You know, and I think you know your you know your ideas about signs though, or some type of parking monitoring is, you know, is a worthwhile consideration. If you know if you think people would park here long term, is there you know there was gonna you know there is a entry kiosk with signs, and there are regulations for the use of the dog park. So there's something that wouldn't have you know there would be signs there anyways. Um, would it be possible uh, to? Uh, put this aside while we start working on the master plan and see if uh, Nate can find out from upstairs whether there is specific language, and if not, then we'll do the general proposal okay. that you suggested. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. Are we mostly just asking, so if we're going to say that CRC recommends to town council the approval of the, but we want to know what to cite is the approval of what exactly? If the language is available and we can look at it today and approve the actual language, we can consider that. If not, then um, I think our plan B is what um, was just described to us by Steve, which is a general motion saying that um, we've reviewed the plans for the dog park and support the uh, uh, final plans for the dog park, including um, the um, action by the council to make uh, a portion of the public way available for the parking that's needed for the park. Um, and it'd be then a general motion without the specifics of the language. 
Sarah. So I just want to make clear, I think it was made clear to us by Chris Rustrup that the only thing that we're actually recommending is just, or if we do, if we vote and we do, is just for the, um, the land to be, um, the right of way changed so that the parking can be there, but we're actually not saying anything about how we feel about the dog park project in general, correct? Yes. Okay. Do you, do you think anyone's upstairs that can? Yeah, I, I, can, I think I can ask and see if there's anything. I don't, there's that's easy enough to, to do. Go. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't we, uh, do we, we don't have to motion, we don't have to move to table, do we? We can just come back to it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So while Chris, so just looking at, yeah, thank you. And so we'll just take you whenever you come back. So I'm going to suggest we even go out of order again and then start on the master plan discussion. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Brestrup, Planning Director. I don't have a presentation um, for today. I understood that you were going to um, come up with questions and um, comments and that you would be looking at uh, items that you felt need to be updated but not replaced, items that need to be replaced and items that might need to be added and any other comments that you might have about um, specific things in the bylaw. Um, I did review the implementation section of the bylaw yesterday and kind of thought about which things have been accomplished and which things are ongoing, so I can answer questions about that. Um, and if you have any specific things that you'd like me to talk about in the beginning of this session, I'd be happy to do that. So let's start there. So are there any general questions about the master plan itself for Chris? And were you all able to look at it and take a stab? Um, no, I think we. What? Yeah. I don't think we have. Sorry. Um, my basic, my starting question is: is the list of what's what is ongoing, what's actually been worked on, what hasn't been looked at, um, because I think that there are some really um, important things in the master plan, but it. But I don't know where, you know, has this report been done? Has this committee been formed? Has, you know, some of those answers about committees I have. But, um, so. Go ahead. Yeah, I think we started to do that last time I was here um, speaking with you. And I can go item by item if you turn to chapter 10, which is the implementation section. And we can go item by item and talk about what has been done and what hasn't been done. The master plan is really you know, a living document and many of the things that are stated as goals and strategies are things that um, are, take a long time to get done or encompass many different uh, aspects of town government in order to accomplish. Um, but I can start to talk to you about what I know about these things, if you want to go line by line, or if there's a particular section that you want to focus on. I am usually more involved with the land use section and perhaps the housing section, um, but I can talk about the other sections as well. So if there's an, a particular se section that you'd like to discuss, I'd be happy to do that, or I can just launch into talking about the land use section, which is really the, the first one that's listed in the implementation matrix. So I think what I'd prefer is rather than, thank you for that offer, so maybe, um, let, me, let me just think for a second. So that might be a good place to start though, is so what I was gonna suggest is that maybe we skip one and two, which are introduction goals and policies and then just work our way through each of the chapters. But they're in hearing primarily, so the, the hope was that this is the counselors for whom some of this is you know, relatively new and just you know, to, hear, to hear what they, you know, to listen to 
what am I looking to say? You know, to hear your comments. So, so um, let's try that. Yeah, go ahead, Andy. I just put out one additional piece, and that is, um, it has been a few years since we did the master plan process, and there are a number of factual observations and findings that are implicit in the plan yep. um, and that lead to the actual um, strategies that are put forward. Some of those probably have not changed, but some have, because there's a lot that uh, has been uh, just passage of time, progress marches forward, and um, so you get into things like, um, looking for examples because I have a long list of things that I wrote down, um, the, the last housing plan was um, the Help me with this, uh, the market study probably? The market study? That was about 2008? 2015. Yeah, 2015. that was 2015. So that's yeah. fairly recent. And there was a, um, a housing production plan done uh, five years ago that expired in 2018. So that was done in 2013. So we have those two housing reports. One focuses on affordable housing and one focuses on market rate housing. So the question is whether there's any information in those plans that needs to be reviewed and incorporated both in the factual findings and in a review of uh, what is in the plan itself in the way of uh, strategies. Uh, there's uh, changing demographics that we're all aware of, um, including things having to do with population, um, school-age children, uh, the falling enrollment uh, in our PK-12 grades, um, and how that might affect any of the findings, um, the increasing age of our population um, that goes along with the fallen school-age population, um, the obvious increasing difficulty of uh, starter families being able to find um, suitable housing and make this an affordable place to live, whether that is a factor that um, needs more change. We know a lot more about climate change than we did when the report was written. There were certain things in the report um, about uh, its stressed use of renewables um, and I think that there's been some change of thinking because of the recognition that some forms of renewable energy are not exactly clean energy, uh, and whether that needs to be revisited. Uh, there's certainly technology changes that are happening at a rapid rate, um, and uh, then there's references in the plan to select board and town meeting and um, bodies that no longer exist because we adopted a new charter. So um, at what point do we just go through the plan to make sure that um, the factual underlie and some of those statements um, are still correct? Is that a rhetorical question? Yeah. It, it, I'm, uh, I, I mean, I think it, was, it was part of what I was thinking about when I was reviewing the plan yeah. today. And I think that that's critical when we start this this master plan update task force or whatever work group, whatever we call it, is that those kinds of things be addressed. Sarah. So that's one of the things that hit me as I was trying to actually look through this master plan that actually by law is for you know a, a planning department to do um, was that the underpinning of the entire thing was all of that information about economics, about demographics. And that's the one thing that to me, even though it's been done like five or six years ago, that those things are really the underpinnings, the foundation of trying to figure out the rest of the master plan. And for me, that was the most 
outdated. So one, I felt a little overwhelmed as just a town council does not have enough information, you know, or knowledge myself, you know, that wow, I really have a lot of catching up to do. But the other was to even try to look at this. It, it seemed to me the same thing that Andy said is that I think that all of the basic knowledge needs to be, or the surveying, those things need to be done first before we can then say, well, I think this should be changed. Steve, um, so there, there's sort of factual underpinnings, which are the size of the town, you know, um, things that we know, particularly from the other studies. But the other part, like uh, there were thousands of surveys done in you know, group meetings in which I was trying to get a sense of the pulse of the town. So if we were to re -go th if we were to go through that again, that's basically another master plan, is to go through that process mm -hmm. again. So th th I guess that's kind of the question is, are we at a point where really this is a matter of simply updating, or are we at a point where this becomes the old master plan and we redo it? I don't know the answer to that. Like, is a change in government enough to make the master plan irrelevant? So as I was pondering this, I was looking at a book I took out from the library yesterday, and when I was looking at the dates of people who had taken it out, one of the last dates that was stamped was the year 2007. And I thought, holy cow, we were still stamping books back in 2007. And for me, I was like, that's, that's actually a long time ago. That, that just hit me as far as like, do we need to completely redo it or not? I'm just thinking about how much has changed in the world and in our town, you know, from the time. And it, it, it seems relatively short, but and then when I think about technology and changing demographics, it was a long time ago. It does seem to me that we need current information about demographics. Uh, we need current information um, about, well, basically that, but I'm also, there's even simpler stuff that I need, <laughs> which is um, when we, you went to housing, Christine, you talked about affordable housing and market rate housing, but there's also moderately uh, affordable I'm just feeling, I'm feeling very naive, um, and I'm not, sh and, and I guess I w also wouldn't be afraid of public input or public groups to talk about some of this stuff again, although that can be disconcerting on many levels. Um, well, you're making a, a lot of sense. We can make this a conversation, so. Um, the uh, um, uh, planning board member McGowan. I'm trying to think of the official title for a planning board. Planning, yeah. No. Um, hi, I'm Janet McGowan. I I was involved in the original master plan, which I think is a long time ago. I think it's way beyond 2010. I think it's like from 2006, and so um, I understand the issues that you're talking about. I think that it would be really useful just to go through the strategy section and work through it. N and not even, I mean, one of the things that jumps out at me is that there's no implementation body. And that's the, one of the first strategies that's, and they're supposed to, you know, one committee that is looking at the implementation of the plan, working with other committees, working with the community, making sure all this happens and doing a yearly update. 
And that never happened. And I think what we, we do see is parts of the master plan have been implemented and parts haven't. And so if you're talking about revising a plan and we don't even know, you know, there's no body to ensure that the next one gets implemented, it seems sort of odd to me. Um, and so, um, you, know, when I, you know, one of the strategies you know, I looked at was a committee on siting, talking about where to site things that people don't want, like maybe a DPW building. So instead of the DPW fire station committee going around and hunting around for sites, that a committee would be looking at good sites or possible sites and also establishing a process for assessing it. And instead of having individual committees do that, there'd be a siting committee. And they would talk about a community process. That never happened. And we see the consequences of that every time you know, anyone tries to cite anything. And I've gone to lots of meetings with people you know, with their hair on fire, kind of you know, neighbors startled. And so you know, I kind of feel like we didn't really implement the master plan in a systematic way. And there's a couple of, bunch of strategies I think, ah, that doesn't really help. You know, why would you focus on transfer development rights in Amherst, it's so small. And, and the other thing I, I'm going to just shoehorn this into what I wanted to say is that the housing study calls for an affordable housing requirement that is more uniform across, um, you know, all the different ways of developing in Amherst of 15 percent, and it, that it be simplified. And right now, we hardly require affordable. We ha require affordable housing in very limited situations under a special permit and a few spots in a thing, and so that idea of an inclusionary zoning a requirement that is recommended in the housing study isn't even in the strategy for affordable housing in the master plan. So that looks like a defect to me. And so, you know, and I think the affordable housing issue is like red hot. And, you know, you could talk about, re, you know, we can do another master plan and put that affordable housing requirement and that'll be in a year or two. Meanwhile, in the planning board, I'm looking at a development of 60 units on Southeast Street and there's no affordable housing in it. There's going to be, you know, hundreds of units going in, you know, have gone in downtown. There's no affordable housing. And then, meanwhile, the town is kind of buying, um, is it Rolling Green? Um, you know, we've given a tax exemption to the North Amherst development. We're looking at these 40R, 40Bs, where you give hyper development in exchange for affordable housing. You know, so, and then we give a tax deduction. So, that, you know, it's, it's like we're in this kind of desperate straits when, we could just be requiring across the board, including subdivisions, 15% of units over a certain amount or 15% of space could be affordable. And so the developers bear the burdens and they share the benefits of Amherst. And so part of me feels with this committee, it's like, you know, maybe identify the issues that are really, you can do something on or do it quickly and do that kind of stuff. And so I have a, some handouts on affordable housing and I wanna hold up on that. but. I keep on thinking like it's really lovely to have this master plan that we're sort of implementing and sort of not and talking about it when there's issues that we're facing as a town that we're not really coming to grips with. So I'm not sure that's going to make you feel better or worse. <laughs> and I, I'm just going to pause this for a second because we're, Nate's back and I want to oh. see if we can finish up that particular. Thanks. I, I spoke with Athena, and there wasn't really a um, you know, anything written. It was just you know approve a permanent use of a public right of way is kind of the language. So the you know what the council is looking for is a recommendation that the parking and the changes you know th that this you know the CRC would would recommend approval of a permanent use of the right of way for parking for the dog park. Um, you know if you you can be more specific if you'd like in terms of referencing the plan, but there really wasn't any wasn't anything written at this time in terms of a request. Okay. Could you say that one more time about the sure, it'd be use of a permit? Yeah, it'd be recommend approval of a permanent use or change of a public right of way. And so I think that's the, you know, that's kind of the key yeah. thing is that it's a permanent change or use of the right of way as opposed to, you know, something temporary. This would be, you know, parking and sidewalks. Would you want to tie it to the set of plans that was reviewed by the planning board? Is this the set we have right here? I believe so. Yeah. Anyone ready to make a motion? Oh. 
Steve, can I ask a question? Um, if you approve it, linked to this plan as permanent, does that mean at some point if you said instead of parking, we want a bike trail, instead of parking, we want X, Y, or Z? So does it restrict us in the future and in, in the use of the public right of way? Yeah, my thought would be if we wanted to change it, it would come back again. So if we wanted to put a bike lane or something different, we'd have to come back and make a separate request. So the request now is for the parking and you know the change of the sidewalk. And if we ever wanted to change that, it would be another request. And does it, it's hard for me to look at the diagram, but does this change where the sidewalk is or is there still a sidewalk? There's still a sidewalk. I mean, the red line kind of goes through right. so the. The sidewalk has shifted maybe about 10 feet. You know, so it, it, you, you know, instead of being straight across along the curb, it now, you know, kind of angles in. So there's sidewalk the plus parking and a street. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Anyone yeah, ready I, to make a motion? I'm working on one. Right okay. Now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're looking at it. Yeah. So what I came up with, what I came up with um, was something like this: move that the community resources committee recommend the permanent use of a portion of the public way to allow for parking for the dog park, as shown on plans approved by the planning board, and consider appropriate parking restrictions to assure appropriate use of those spaces. Thank you. Is that a second? Sam, Andy, you've got that written down on you, that part of it. Um, what I'll do is I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll write it up as an email and send it to you after the meeting and then you can just okay. copy and paste it. But again, I'll read it one more time since I have it written on the back of a piece of paper. Move that the Community Resources Committee recommend the permanent use of a portion of the public way to allow for parking for the dog park as shown on plans approved by the Planning Board and consider uh, appropriate parking restrictions to assure um, I hate to use the word appropriate trice, um, uh, use of those spaces um, for the, um, as anticipated. You mean, okay, that's good. So there's a motion. So moved. There's a motion and there was a second, yep. Yep, so um, any more discussion? All in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All opposed? It's uh, passes four zero one, one absent. I'm sorry, four zero one absent. Thanks. Thank you. Back to the easy stuff. <laughs> that was that was the hard stuff. The easy stuff is updating the master plan. <laughs> so I just wanted to make two comments that I think are informative, um, and one is that we may not want to if we choose to update the master plan, we may not want to do that until after the 2020 census, mm -hmm. because then we'll have all the new demographic information, and it will probably be a year or two after that census that we actually have the information. And the second thing I wanted to say is many of the plans that have been done subsequent to the master plan, like the housing market study, like the transportation plan, et cetera, were incorporated by reference into the master plan by the planning board. Uh, in a vote, and I can probably troll through planning board minutes and find out exactly which plans have been incorporated. So that means that all of the information and recommendations that would be in the housing market study would be considered to be part of the master plan. That would be incredibly helpful. So if I may, so, um, 
So Janet is right that the master plan process started, I believe, in 2006. And then it took at least, a, it took a solid four years, of which the, most of the, the visioning sessions were in the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then there was a writing, and there was a writing group, and then the planning board was basically the editing group. And then it was all past February 2010. So there are parts of it that were old. Part of it was old by the time it was written, frankly. Mm -hmm. You know, it was already four years old. Um, but that's what we'll get with a new master plan also. So, so yeah, but so there are, I think there's basic things that can be updated, like, you know, I don't want to say today, but like right now. <laughs> Not right now, mm -hmm. but like in corp uh, the other documents that could be, that are part of the, that can be attached to the master plan or have been approved to be incorporated, that part could be updated. It also seems like changes in things like the form of government, you know, some really basic things like that would, but whether or not it's worth it to get into all that without, I, I guess we're really trying to get a sense of what level of, of um, updating we need. So there's also the, so just, you know, listening to Janet's comments, there was basically the objectives, the strategies, and then the implementation, right? So like the implementation is requiring whatever the Southeast Tree Zone is, requiring that particular zone, that particular circumstance to, to you know, have certain characteristics so that we can achieve, if it's stated in the master plan, you know, to achieve those goals. So that's part of it. So that wouldn't be in the master plan itself, but that would be a strategy or an objective in the master plan. There was something called the MPIC, the Master Plan Implementation Committee. Mm -hmm. Go go MPIC. And it was never populated. So, um, you know, there are little things like that. Yes. Um, I'm sort of going to jump in on uh, the more abstract level that you were just on, Steve, on an objective, a strategy, and implementation, um, using the example of affordable housing. Yep. The way I tend to think of those, and when I was first reading through the master plan, if I basically said this is a good objective, I looked at whether the strategy had all the prongs in it that I thought it needed, and there yep. were a few places that I thought there might be one missing. Yep. So I give as an example for affordable housing, Cambridge has an inclusionary zoning law that's any anything over 10 units yep. goes to 10%, so it doesn't need a special permit, and it could yep. be a renovation. But I mean, it's, it's a tool, you know, yep. whether Amherst wants to have that tool, so that's not in our strategy box. If we think we've got good strategies the question I'd ask is, do we have a barrier to implementation? Is there something else that we've got in town? So I'd look at you know, the flow and which are, are moving quite well, maybe slower than we want them to, and which there's the goal. The strategy seems to have failed because nothing's been implemented. You know, so just I would go through it s systematically that way. Um, so it doesn't need a total update. It needs to say, you know, where is where are we missing a tool we might need? Yeah. Where are we missing an implementation strategy? We that was part of the plan was to evaluate implementation. Did it work? You know, you know, so it's sort of coming back to say pretty far along on this one. Didn't even start on that. You know, on on going through major areas. I mean, we're cer certainly doing a lot of infill to downtown. I mean, UMass is doing it faster than we are. It, yep. that soon they won't have a square foot of grass left. <laughs> but, um, but you know, are we getting the kind of lively, walkable, accessible community we thought we would get? And if not, why? You know, I would be asking questions like that. Um, so is it pieces of our zoning law we're missing some key tool? Or is it the zoning law doesn't have a steerage mechanism that would steer you in one direction or another. You know, what is what do four other towns that we m look at might be like? So I, I think that way about it, Anna, is the strategy missing something that we might need, and that's why it hasn't been implemented, or if we tried to implement it and been blocked, and what was the blockage? 
and I know that's too abstract, but I could go through each piece of that. You know, I, I come from a healthcare background, and it's like, why don't we have price control in the United States? Well, we don't have any powerful purchasers. So it's like, there's a goal, we'd like more affordable. Like, what are the pieces we don't have that the rest of the world has? So this is more a way of thinking about it very locally with things we, you know, maybe we don't have agreement around the goals, but if we like the goals, you know, what happened along the way? So I hate to be the, uh, the guy with, I realize I, with a, a lot of history here, but I'm trying to think of like the discussion. So we have to put ourselves back in this 2006, 2010 period, right? Mm -hmm. So, so 2007, I believe, is when the first inclusionary zoning bylaw was passed by, was proposed by the planning board and then approved. So I, I think that's around the time. So around the time the master plan was being developed, that became a law, inclusionary zoning, which on face value required, you know, 10% uh, affordable housing, more or less, for um, housing development with more than 10, for, more than 10 units. For all that never got tested until buildings started being built in downtown. So a big part of the master plan is infill, right? But Steve, it's 10%, but not for site plan review. There's no requirement for that, right? Hang on one sec. Okay. <laughs> So whatever it was, it was a good faith effort to have an inclusionary zoning bylaw. Um, there was no test of whether or not that was a good zoning bylaw and still build it. You know, it's all theory until it's not, until it's, there's actual projects. So there are also incentives in the master plan followed by zoning bylaw changes that try to encourage development and really what was a one story downtown you know, right next door to a very large, you know, university. So that made little sense to have a, you know, so there was an encouragement to have denser mixed use projects in that part of town. So many of us know what the flaws were with the inclusionary zoning bylaw. That's not part of the master plan. That's more of a, a nuance and know the years of you know, efforts to address what those, you know, what those issues are. So really what the point was that this was a very different land, the downtown was a very different landscape, you know, you know, 10 years ago when the master plan was approved. Yeah, Andy. You know, I appreciate um, all the points that have been raised by you and Janet. Um, the, Financial reality for the town, too, is a part of this that without regular course of new growth, which is more than just replacing um, outdated single story underutilized places in the center of town, but is also a matter of uh, assuring that we um, have a town that is going to have the economic vitality and ability to meet the needs that we expect for many things that are actually incorporated in the master plan, there's sort of this balancing act that needs to take place. And um, it is how do we um, encourage and require inclusion of affordable housing and not discourage any development because discouraging development um, doesn't serve the purposes either. And uh, so the, it's a very careful balance and it's one of the challenges for the planning board to try and figure that out um, so that it comes out with the right, in the right place with a uh, something that uh, encourages and requires more affordable housing but not to the point where it discourages development. Yeah. I think that's the conundrum that we've been dealing with for the last 10 years, but I also wanted to talk a little about comparing ourselves to some of the cities and towns in the eastern part of the state where land is much, much more expensive and um, affordability is much more difficult to achieve, and um, there's also a tremendous um, pressure 
on those places for development. So it's more, um, it's easier for a place like Cambridge or Brookline to require um, that these developments include affordable units, even if they don't have special permits or whatever, because people are so eager to develop there and they're so eager to get the high rents that they can get from the market rate units that they're willing to do just about anything to accommodate that. And we don't have quite that situation here. Our property values are high in the downtown area as well as throughout the rest of the town, but they're not at the point where um, you, we have that kind of pressure and we also don't have that kind of development pressure because we've managed to um, save a lot of our town via uh, conservation APRs, um, conservation restrictions, et cetera. So um, I just wanted to offer that, that when we compare ourselves to Cambridge and Brookline, it's really not an exact um, comparison. Maybe we should compare ourselves to East Hampton, Northampton, Holyoke, and the towns that are near us. And I also wanted to say that we do have, one of our goals over the past 20 years that I can remember has been to keep our level of affordability above 10%, so we're not faced with unfriendly 40B developments. And I think that's one of the things that's been in the back of our minds, and we are lucky enough to have over 11% right now, which is considered really good. Throughout the state, there are very few cities and towns that do have over 10%, and we need to be proud of ourselves for that. And we did achieve a, um, an award, um, I think two years ago, for our excellence in creating affordable housing. So we have a little bit of uh, business to pat ourselves on the back about. I know we don't have enough of affordable housing, but we shouldn't feel like we're really failing at providing it. And more recently, um, we've had some developments that are providing affordable housing. We have Barry Roberts' property on University Drive, which is gonna have four units of affordable housing. We have Aspen Heights, which is um, the old Amherst Motel property, which is going to have 11 units of affordable housing. So sprinkled throughout town, we, we are developing affordable housing in little bits and pieces. And of course, we have 132 Northampton Road, which may or may not come to pass, but that would be another uh, 28 units if it were to come to pass. So those are just some thoughts that sprang to mind. And I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> I just want to say, in a general way, the uh, Amherst Motel <laughs> Um, evicted a lot of people. That project evicted people without any uh, backup plans. And so long term, if we're going to be a community that is uh, a just community, we've got to plan that to um, you know, just an aside. I know your values, Chris, and I appreciate them. But So the Amherst Motel, the old Amherst Motel, and I know some of what you're discussing, but that would not be considered part of the 11% because it's not on the inventory. Right. So that would be sort of more of an informal affordable housing, you know, situation that's, yeah. Uh, I, I have a little handout just of some examples from the state. Sorry. Okay. Huh. The Mr. Dog Park, sure. So, you know, I, I, I like the discussion about, you know, um, one aspect of the plan, but, you know, the master plan has so many pieces, and I, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, about does the community agree on the goals, and then how fine-grained we want to get it in terms of implementation, and so, you know, I've often thought that, um, you know, if we can agree on the goals, maybe then we develop a process for, for implementation, so, you know, if we don't know what the right percentage is, for instance, for affordable housing, but we know that we want to get there, then, you know, we have, we can have a, you know, whether it's the MPEC or some, some committee that would work toward that. So what is the right way to get more affordable housing across the board? I don't, you know, I, I do feel like the master plan could have had more implementation, but then at the same time, if it's too prescriptive and things change, like you said, over 10 years, you know, what's the planning horizon? You know, are we, is the plan irrelevant? So is it, you know, I'd like to think that we could try to get a plan that has a really broad consensus in town and then, you know, maybe exact implementation measures are, are not, you know, it's not so specified, but it's, you know, there's a process that it outlines to get there, whether it's by a committee or a group. And so if we, for instance, like with transportation and complete streets, what does that mean? We say we want complete streets and a, you know, a pedestrian bicycle network, but 
I, I can't imagine the master plan can get down to a little detail of what that looks like for every street in town. You know, what does it look like in one neighborhood or village center? But if we know that that's a goal, what are some strategies? And then really what's the process to actually implement that? Is that through the TAC, the Transportation Advisory Committee, or is there another way to set that up? You know, the same would go for historic preservation or other pieces of the master plan, because I think there's so much that can be put into it, but, you know, some communities do a master plan in a year, you know, right? They really, they really have a lot of robust process and they just, and they get it there so that it's not dragged out. I, I was part of the master planning process. I came in when, as an intern, and I helped with the mailings and doing the website and online surveys, and, you know, we did 600, ma you know, we mailed out 600 surveys, and I think the process was great, but then it took so long, you know, it, it took a few years. So I, to me, that f it felt like a long time. So, you know, we have people coming in saying, well, I'm not sure I agree with this anymore. You know, they maybe even committed their survey comments and two years later, their ideas change. And so I just, you know, I'm not sure we need to, I, I mean, to me it would be like, how, what's the process? I think we've actually done a lot in the master plan. And so I like the idea of kind of re reviewing. We've often talked about what, what has been done and then where are there barriers or obstacles? And to me it would be like, what would a new master plan look like? You know, I don't know what's a good example, but is there, you know, what, what are we, what would we even think would a new master plan look like? Does it follow the goals, objective strategies, or is there another format um, to help the community along? I, you know, I just, I feel like, you know, I work with the housing trust and the affordable housing. I've been doing parking, working with the downtown parking working group, and the consultants were saying for parking, we're hoping they provide methodology and a way that the town can then use their plan in the future. We're not necessarily asking them to prescribe, say, a certain price point for parking, but tell us how to get to that price point. So we're not, you know, we're not reliant on the, the consultant every time we want to make a change, but they give us a process to use. And so the master plan to me sometimes didn't describe that process. You know, how do we get to all these objectives we like? And maybe if we had an implementation committee, that would have helped. But I felt like it fell on all these various boards, you know, these different boards and committees to do that. I think it is being implemented piece by piece, and um, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust is a good example of that. The trust has been working really hard on developing the East Street property, and that's a property where we may get as many as, I believe, 30 um, family-sized units, affordable family-sized units. So incrementally, we are building up our numbers, and it may not be um, as apparent to the public, because these things aren't often written up in the in the uh, Gazette, but it, but we are working on multiple things at the same time, particularly in the area of affordable housing. Yeah. Uh, Chris, when I was reading through um, the, report, the master plan, there was an emphasis on um, flag lot changes. And, for, um, the master plan. I'm sorry. But the idea of um, developing more densely, and there's information in here about flag lot development and changes in zoning to allow that kind of thing and cluster development, which, which I believe we have. Um, so uh, can you tell me anything about those kinds of zoning changes? I, I'm searching flag lot or flag even. I can't find anything. Yeah. So I think little by little um, we are. Yeah. We are infilling. Um, I can give you a couple of examples, and some of it has to do with reinterpretation of what the zoning bylaw means. Um, there's a property on North Prospect Street. It was owned by the Hastings family, and it was a single-family home, and it had a large piece of property. Um, a person came along and wanted to develop the property into a duplex, and I think it was either four or six, probably four townhouses. And in the past, um, the, d the interpretation of the zoning bylaw would have been that um, you couldn't have two uh, principal uses on the same property um, unless you you know, had an act of God or something. So there's a current interpretation that's different from that, and that allowed that property to be developed. Instead of having one single unit for a single family, it now 
is approved to have eight units on the property. Um, there's another property down on um, near the railroad tracks that used to be owned by Nancy Hamill. Um, that used to be a house, and then it was divided in, uh, into offices. Currently, it's being proposed to have, uh, in addition to the house office, it's going to have 16 units of, um, of, of apartments. Uh, in, it's in a mixed-use building. But anyway, the interpretation now is that um, an office building and a mixed-use building can exist side by side on the property. There needs to be a finding by the planning board um, or the zoning board of appeals, depending on which uh, kind of a case you're looking at, that says that the two uses are complementary to one another. But I think that is really helping to um, promote uh, infill in some of the inner neighborhoods, particularly the RG and the BN. And um, we really haven't changed zoning so much as changed the interpretation of the zoning to allow those kinds of things to happen. But Mr. Schreiber is aware of a property, I think it was on Gray Street, that was also proposed for um, infill. And that was um, quite contentious because um, there was a house that was going to be built in back of another house. And neighbors really didn't uh, think that was a good idea. So that we have to be kind of careful because these are existing neighborhoods that where people feel very strongly about the way things should be. and don't necessarily want to see things change to the extent of, you know, building a house in back of another house. So we're sort of working on it, and it's happening, but it's not necessarily in the spotlight. In a place like Amherst, so Amherst, if you look at a property owner, if you look at the GIS, we have all of these back lots. So you know, there's not an extraordinary number of streets, so it's not really an urban area with streets every 300 feet or something like that, but because it was developed really as a rural community. So without putting in new streets, really the only way to achieve infill in some of these areas is through either a flag lot ordinance, a flag lot bylaw, or a smaller frontage which essentially is what a flag lot is. So, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it says here, like I, I'm looking at page three of the strategy, and it's HIF, demographics and housing, allow two family houses by right in all residential zoning districts. I think we have that now because, somewhat because of town meeting has said that you could have an extra unit on your house or every garage or outbuilding can be turned into an 800 square unit. And so I've told people this because I, you know, I thought it was kind of, it covers, you know, the whole, every zoning area, you can basically turn your um, large shed or garage into a, a 800 square foot house. And almost nobody knows about this. And to me, this is a way of doing infill and easing the burden on people who they can have a separate apartment on their house or a little tiny house next to them or a small house next to them. Not so small, because a lot of my neighbors live in 900 square feet houses. And, you know, and if you are worried about taxes and you're living by yourself, maybe you move into that smaller unit and you rent your thing. So to me, that's a great strategy for increasing density but without changing the real look of the town, and it makes everything more affordable. People don't know about it, and also people probably don't can't afford. A lot of people don't think they can have the money to, you know, get the fifty or sixty or whatever hundred thousand dollars to do that. And so, you know, it's like what's so the goal has sort of been achieved. We have the flexible zoning, but the str it can't be implemented because lack of knowledge or lack of money. And maybe the town could have a no interest or a low interest loan program for that kind of conversion. And then it would also stimulate a lot of local construction companies who could specialize in that. And you might, you know, say, okay, your garage is now going to be an 800 square foot thing, and it should be accessible because we're all going to be using a walker from some days, as far as I can tell. And so I think that's the kind of, you know, if, if the MOPEC was there saying, hey, we achieved that goal, but we didn't get the result, why not? And almost nobody knows about it. And, you know, it's daunting. It's probably daunting for a homeowner to undertake that or take that kind of loan. And you could work with local banks and say, hey, this is what we're interested in. So that's the kind of MOPEC thing I think could happen. And MOPEC could work with the housing people saying, you got this great stuff. You've done part of it. How do we make it a coherent package or what is the result of our steps? So, so that part st struck me also. So um, 
because I think it's a great idea that any residential zone, two-family house, owner-occupied, should be, in my opinion, allowed by site plan review, as it is in some. So um, it's allowed by right in RG and RVC, not allowed at all in RF, or I guess that's the only residential district that's can you say that again, RG and R? So the straight up residential zones, you can do a two, and I'm not talking about a supplemental dwelling, which is slightly different. Okay. So okay. it's okay. a older occupied duplex is allowed by right, site plan review in RG and RVC, and allowed by special permit in the other, all other residential zones, except okay. for RF, which is fraternity. Fraternity. Yeah. And then it's not allowed in, it's allowed in, um, another zone, but I think that two-family house, being able to have a two-family house is, in a, is a very efficient way of keeping the look and feel of Amherst and then doubling. It's a very efficient way of taking a single-family community and doubling the density, right? Because you're not adding new structures. Then on top of that, we have the converted dwelling mm -hmm. bylaw, which as you point out, can actually make some properties three family. So you can have by right, two family in the front or and then converted uh, um, supplemental dwelling somewhere else. Am I, am I right, Chris? Yeah. Yes, you can yes. Have, uh, it's converted dwelling is sort of an yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't know if I said um, supplemental dwelling. dwelling yeah, converted dwelling, dwelling something yeah. else. Yeah. So all of this assumes owner occupancy also, mm -hmm. which is a neighborhood stabilization. Yes. And everything that you just said, Janet, about being able to stay in your house, why not build a converted dwelling, live there, rent out the front of the house, you know, whatever, or the main house. So it's a good way to keep neighborhood stability, to keep, um, mm -hmm. keep people in their houses longer than they might be able to. The counter, <laughs> there's always the counter, the, the mm -hmm. countervailing force mm -hmm. is students, um, Airbnb, uh, you know, short-term rentals, you know, in other words, there's other forces at work here you know, too. So we haven't sort of reached, that's sort of an unsettled issue, is who's going to be living in these, mm -hmm. you know, densified properties. So that brings up an issue that um, came up when the town was, planning board was looking at um, infill in the RG and thinking of making it possible to have smaller lots with smaller houses on them. And then immediately the flag went up, um, is our um, investors going to come in and buy these smaller lots and put, um, you know, home storehouses on them which have nothing to do with the uh, neighborhood that don't look anything like um, the architecture that's already existing there. And how can we uh, allow this to happen um, without, number one, you know, having the neighborhoods fill up with rentals and number two, having houses pop up all over the place that don't look like the rest of the neighborhood. So to some degree that the, what it looks like has been solved over to the west of the downtown in the local historic district because they can control um, what the new buildings look like. But the issue of whether these can be um, built by investors and rented, it hasn't been dealt with. So that's an opportunity that we've been mm -hmm. considering, but we haven't figured out the details enough to make it work. So that would be something that you know we would be, I think the planning board would be interested in working on. Another small clarification, because uh, you use the term renters, but it sounded to me like you meant student renters. Student renters, I'm sorry. Yes, of <laughs> no, the course. only reason, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because there's a big yeah. difference in no, what we, we don't agree. have is yeah. enough rental stock at a reasonable price. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure why I'm saying this, but <laughs> just because I live on Meadow Street and because it's, it's so much students and a long time ago when um, my husband's grandparents lived there they did have an apartment upstairs and so I think that there's there has to be some way to kind of this is a problem I think that all of Amherst has and we know it but because I live with it all the time I just want to say like lots of times you can have like that little extra place but in some parts of town that little extra place will that should maybe house two people will now house ten people and I think that the other thing is is that in certain areas um, students will pay so much more for for rentals that the thing is is that you know you may say oh well 
you know, I'm just going to rent out that small space for $800 a month. And then your buddy over coffee says, are you kidding? You could rent it for 2000 And, you know, and it, for some people that makes such a huge difference that, it, you know, if you could get 2000 you know, why wouldn't you? So it's just, I don't know how you, I don't know how you regulate those things so that it remains safe. But I, I definitely think that there's, there's, violation of that and even like some people who are supposed to be owner occupied and everybody who lives around knows that that person actually lives in Florida so just I'm, I'm preaching to the choir I'm just saying Time like that's make another a phone thing. call to the inspector building inspector and tell them yeah and the other Cambridge started this program because obviously Cambridge has a lot of affordability and students and they have this thing called Nesterly and it's like a online program or a program to get you know, grad students and I know well-behaved undergrads and you know the uh, the foreign graduate student that everybody is always seeking into people's homes who have kind of empty nesters and so that could be a program that we set up. It's like I think we could increase housing without building new units. And what are the ways to do that that don't put huge pressure on neighborhoods but alleviate problems? And they've even thought, well, there's always problems when you have individuals or people together. And we have all these mediators in town that meet monthly. Maybe they could do a service of mediating problems and stuff. So I just think there's a lot of ways to, to crack the nut of housing in a way that's not going to change the face of Amherst. But I do think that we need to have a super simple, comprehensive, affordable housing requirement. You know, the consultant recommended 15%. I've never heard that mentioned before. I mean, maybe I just lost track of things, but if it was 10%, if it was 8%, you know, the developer that is looking at the 60 units on Southeast Street is looking to do the same thing across. There's, you know, just hundreds of units going in, and it's all good, but what if 8 or 10 or 15% were affordable, and we just required that when you do a subdivision, you set aside lots or space. I mean towns do that and you want to pick the right number but we don't have a comprehensive number across methods of development and so and that was the recommendation of the consultant so um, where to folks I'm trying to get back to my notes here I, I think, you know, having gone through, I, I'm, I lost track of who said this, but there is a ton that we have tried to address in our own, not necessarily, so that I know the planning board has taken a lot of the strategies and tried to craft a way to, you know, to implement those. But, yeah. I mean, I, I saw as I was going through it, and I don't want to um, go section by section, but I saw lots of places where different thing, uh, bodies were created over time to take on pieces of it. There was a section, for example, on budget that talked about long-term and short-term uh, planning, and there was actually a body that um, was created when John Misanti was finance director um, that did exactly that, um, and there was a uh, uh, community choices committee, I think was what the name of it was, and they produced a fairly comprehensive report. I was actually on the committee, which is why I sort of remember this. Um, so there have been pieces that have been picked up, and um, they, one of the things that I really appreciated in looking at the master plan is not how much we haven't done, but how much we have done. We've really done quite a bit, and it's not just in the area of planning, but it picks up in numerous other areas. Um, the, um, and I, I do think that uh, the basics, and I think it's Janet, you said this at the Zoning Subcommittee meeting that I was at, that uh, the core of the plan is well, really well stated and uh, we shouldn't be messing with, the core, with, with what the plan is, but looking at the pieces, and I think that's what we're really kind of in the same thinking that you are, or at least we're at that meeting, let me put it that way.
Yeah, so well, along that line, I think a, foc a focus could be focus on, the, focus on the strategies. So rather than focus on the rewrite or even the objectives, because the objectives are, I think are generally general enough to you know, still apply. I didn't see any of that seem to be irrelevant now. But I think some of the strategies could be definitely updated and updated for two reasons. Well, maybe more than two reasons. One is that they've been done. A lot's been done. Mm -hmm. And the other one is, well, it's either been done, not relevant, or needs to be added and wasn't there in the, in the first place. I think those are. Some of the things we probably don't want to do that we, we tried to do and we found out that they didn't work out, like transfer of development rights. Yeah, that was so we, we could have a line. Yeah, of, yeah so done that, didn't work. Right. It never made it past the planning board, right? It, or never made it. it never made it past the planning board because nobody wanted to be the recipient of the units. People wanted to be the giver of the units from <laughs> their property to some other property, but they didn't want to be the recipient in the neighborhoods. And some we tried, like form-based codes, we didn't get it passed, we, we can try again. I mean, there's still things here that are very relevant. Um, I, and, you know, I understand, like, the, the amorphous complexity of your task, and I was thinking that by focusing on this to-do list and strategies, you'd get more information of, like, what's not working in the master plan and what is. And so if you're gonna do a revision, I don't think it would have to be, like, a three-year effort. You'd be just more, like, oh, it's, you know, you're kind of more into it, into their weeds, and so you can sit back and just do a fast cut on it. Um, another, it, it, this is super random, but I just thought Sarah might have some help. There's a whole thing about like doing priority soils, farm soils, and you know, focusing on a kind of a comprehensive protection of farmland. Did it? Did that ever get done? You know, and so I just wa I wonder like on you know, so I don't I don't think. I just, you know, I, when I was going through it, I was going question mark, no, yes, you know, kind of things. And there's not everything I know. I think you would have a better sense. But I think if you're working through it, and this discussion would get deeper, and then you can sort of say the TDR was interesting and didn't work. Or maybe it could have worked if it, you know, whatever. If it was not 2008 during a crash, you know, it might have been better, you know, during a peak or something. I don't know. But I think sort of digging into this will help revising it in a way. Yeah. Are you imagining a multi-session um, dive into the master plan? Um, Not necessarily. <laughs> I think we wanted just to have this conversation. Mm. But. Do you want to start going through these things line by line? Through the... Um, through the strategies? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry, Pat. Yeah. So it no, but go easier for you, but uh, I don't see this not being a multi-session idea because there's, I, th I don't want to just flip through and go through each strategy. I, I think this is a wonderful idea, what worked, what didn't work, what might change that. I think that's excellent. Um, but I don't want to just flip through and, and do that um, in some quick <laughs> process. Um, totally agree. I agree with you that the core values are good. I think there's a lot of positives in here. I don't see us rewriting the whole thing. I really don't. Um, and, and I agree with you, Pat. But m I guess my question is, do we want this to be the, this exercise definitely has to happen. But sh should it be the CRC or should it be this other group, the master plan update committee? Yeah. What the hell is this committee about, I guess, is my blunt question um, to us, to all of us, uh, because it, you know, um, that's my blunt question. So here's a suggestion. Um, what you might consider doing is spending a half hour, 45 minutes at each of your meetings going through the, these strategies and deciding whether it's something that you want to keep or eliminate or say you've already done it or say you want to spend time working on it. And that means that you wouldn't hijack, you know, whole meetings, but you could spend 
some amount of time at every meeting. And then, you know, probably as you work through it, your things will become clearer to you. And I would just say, just as far as like setting goals and implementation, I think that we should sort of think about, even if it's this body, but creating a body that is in charge of that, because I agree with what Nate said, which is, you know, if you can then look at a strategy, I mean, in order to get to a goal, you need to really define that goal, I think, in a pretty precise way, even if it changes next year. But if you say this year, this is our goal, and then you can chunk it down into we need to do this by this time, and we need to do that by that time. At least you feel, and there's somebody who's sort of guiding it, who's sort of looking at things that are happening in that area and making sure you're working towards it. I think that you're, that would stimulate more thought and also more forward progress to know exactly what your goal is and how you're going to get there. Hmm. Patty raised a good question, which she asked, uh, what is the role of the committee? And uh, gets back to the other side of the question with the role of the planning board. And uh, the development of master plan is really principally the responsibility under the state statute of the planning board and even under our charter. Uh, I don't think that the uh, creation of the master plan is the uh, role of the council, I think it's the role of the council to review and approve, but uh, it really is a planning board document, not a council document. It's a, it's a very, and I don't know if every state is like this, but it's sort of, and then Chris, you struck, one comment you made at the very beginning that struck me was that the part, and of course the part you're most familiar with is the land use part because transportation and you know some of the other parts are are not your you know not your jurisdiction and so here we have the planning board which is a subset of any community focusing on land use primarily responsible for and quite frankly not only responsible for developing the planning board and then they're the body that's entrusted to approve it but it's things way out of their jurisdiction also. Same things that, um, but that's what we have. So. so that's why I think things like the transportation plan, which was approved in 2015, I believe, and the open space and recreation plan, which has been updated, um, I think it was last summer, and all of these plans that are, you know, plans that are sort of offshoots of the, pl of the master plan that have been incorporated by reference are important to remember because those were, they, those were worked on by bodies that actually knew a lot about those particular topics or became knowledgeable as they worked on them. And um, so we do actually have you know, expertise in those areas, not necessarily in the planning board, but in these other bodies. Uh, this gets to um, the idea of working groups, um, which the uh, GOL was looking at, but it also gets to what is the purpose of this committee, and it's to study the <coughs> impact of decisions um, that we potentially can make or are being made by the planning board or any other board. So my point really is we need to create liaisons to those committees who are working more directly and it has to come from the five of us. I mean, otherwise, you know, and I think that's realistic. <coughs> Let's go through this track. So you're, you're absolutely right that when this um, committee was even being conceived, one of the ideas would be that we would be the master plan update committee that works closely with the planning board. But let's go, let's try to go through this trip. So one thing the planning board was looking for from town council was some guidance about um, what you think of is the status of the master plan and 
whether you think the master plan needs to be completely redone, um, somewhat redone, updated, um, approved as it is, just some idea from town council, what direction should the planning board take? Because when, if you decided that you wanted to redo the master plan process, that would cost a lot of money and we would have to um, appropriate, you know, 100,000 or probably more than that to hire a consultant to go through the process. So it's gonna be a community effort and it would need the backing of town council in order to get this rolling. On the other hand, if we're going to update the plan that we already have, that's a whole different, you know, kettle of fish and we can do that in house and we can do that with the planning board and the CRC and eventually with town council. So just wanted to state that. Let's go through the list. Okay. So if you go to your implementation matrix, page one, um, LU1 says preferentially direct future development to existing built up areas. So um, the first thing is LU1A, inventory and identify existing developed areas that are appropriate for density increases and redevelopment. So I think we've been doing that on an ongoing basis. It's rather incremental as we've been going around neighborhoods and looking at pieces of land that could be subdivided and potentially um, redeveloped. But it's, it's sort of an ongoing process and it's a process that we um, engage with developers with, discussions with developers, but we also talk about it in-house. So there's no sort of one thing that I can point to that we do there, but it is something that we're always thinking about. Um, the second thing is LU1B, evaluate built up areas on the basis of character, quality, and, and priority, identifying areas to emphasize preservation, so historic areas of the downtown and village centers. So that's where I can point to um, the areas that are right adjacent to the downtown. I think we recently went through a whole process where we adopted a local historic district west of downtown. We currently have a local historic district east of downtown, which does a very good job on pre preserving uh, the buildings that are already there and making sure the buildings that are new are going to be compatible. Um, emphasize adaptive reuse, um, particularly high quality historic areas of the downtown. Well, we don't really have the kinds of buildings that say East Hampton has or even North Hampton, the old mill buildings and things like that, but I think we've done a pretty good job of um, reusing the historic buildings in our downtown area and um, you know that's really on a case by case basis. Which are the historic buildings in downtown? I would say all the buildings along um, Main Street and the buildings along South Pleasant Street. And there's nothing yeah. along East Pleasant? Probably there are buildings along East Pleasant. Um, some of the wood frame buildings, yeah. So, okay. If the Central Fire Station became empty, there would be- That would be a- Historic building yes. for potential adaptive reuse. Yeah. And that has been talked about as a, a, an entertainment venue. I'm not sure where that project is right now, but there's a group of people that's been looking at the fire station for adaptive reuse. So, Chris, I don't want to dog you, but is that, are those discussions going on with the historic, I, mean, I always get the committee's name wrong, like what's historic downtown and evaluating like what downtown should be preserved or protected with the historic committee? Who's it? Who's it? The I think we have two different ones, yeah. right? Yeah. So the historic commission usually historic looks at things on a case-by-case -case basis when something is being proposed to be either torn down or changed in some way. I don't think they have um, a global uh, project that they're working on to evaluate um, historic buildings in the downtown. So perhaps that's something that we would want to work on. Actually, I'm glad that you raised that because that was one point that I had specifically cited as I in the noted as I went through the master plan in preparation for today's meeting. Uh, when is an old car dealership an historic building is the one that most people talk about, but I think what really is there is exactly the question that you wrote, what I wrote down is what are significant historical aspects of downtown? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that we've really come to 
uh, an ability to make that judgment, which is why you get into the question of people debating whether an old car dealership might in fact be an historic building or not. Well, I have some ancient history. So I was at the, at the Emily Dickinson Historic, I think it was the Historic Commission, and they were having a public meeting, and they kept on, you know, talking about the need to protect the Emily Dickinson Historic, the houses there, and they kept on using examples of downtown, like the Bank of America building and this. And I said, well, why don't you, you know, protect downtown, you know, because you have all these criticisms of all these things. And then the answer from the head was like, oh, that's, we're doing this first, and then we're going to do downtown next. And that one of the master plans says is to identify different areas for historic districts and do that. And so I'm not sure the commission is doing a systematic look at downtown or other areas, like where else, like maybe the South Common area, you know, is obviously. I don't think they are. I don't think they are. That could be like so a whole. It could be a project that they could work on. I'm thinking um, adaptive reuse would relate to Amherst Works, where the old mm -hmm. bank building has mm -hmm. been turned into a place where people can, can work, but they've preserved the interior and exterior yeah. of the building. Um, okay, you want to move on? Yep. Allow a varying combination of preservation and redevelopment, other village centers, transitional or neighborhood business areas. So um, in North Amherst, um, the property that's being developed by Coles has been um, adaptively reusing some of their buildings. They um, redeveloped a barn and created the Atkins North up there. Um, they have maintained their office building at 134 Montague Road, um, which is an old house, an old farmhouse used as an office building now. Um, they have plans to reuse a, a, a barn that is right on the edge to the east of Atkins Farms. Um, and there is also, I believe there's also something they call the Onion Barn on the north side of uh, Coles Road that they've been thinking about um, re redoing, preserving and redoing. Um, so that's a combination of preservation and redevelopment. Um, allowing more extensive development and redevelopment with a balance of incentives and controls highway commercial corridors and research parks, more extensive development and redevelopment. Um, so that is probably something that we are not doing now, but we certainly could do that. Um, we do have uh, research parks that are designated, but for various reasons they haven't been developed. Some of the reasons are that the research parks tend to be really wet, especially the one along Belchertown Road um, going towards um, Amherst, Woods um, and the research park up in North Amherst. Um, some of it does not have water and sewer, so that's a challenge for developing those properties. Um, but those properties could be developed if uh, the ones in North Amherst could be developed if water and sewer extended up there. And that may be a project that we want to consider doing in the future. Um, encourage denser development of appropriate scale and design in village centers in downtown. Well, I think we, we could debate about whether some of the development is appropriate scale and design, but we have certainly um, seen denser development in the downtown with One East Pleasant Street, Kendrick Place, and Boltwood Place, and we're probably going to see um, the pro project on Spring Street happening fairly soon. That was approved by the Planning Board a few years ago. There's also been a proposal, uh, there was a proposal to develop the property that contained Bertucci's um, that uh, kind of is lying fallow for the time being, and I don't know what's going to happen with that property, but we are seeing um, development in the downtown. So is a way to make sure it's appropriate to, is to, how would you do that? Like give the design review board authority instead of just recommendations to kind of control the look? Design review board could have more authority, yes, and we could also establish form-based code which we haven't done, but we've talked about doing that in the downtown, so that's probably something that we should look at. And if we do establish a 40-yard district, um, uh, form-based code is part of the 40-yard district. So uh, let's see. Using flexible zoning techniques such as form-based codes to promote mixed-use development. Well, we haven't used form-based code, but we have used flexible zoning techniques, and we do have a lot of mixed-use development. So I'd say we have... Um, seen the results of that, I'd say we, we either have done or are doing that. Um, and again, we need to look back and see if we want to incorporate form-based code. 
Um, D is undertake rezoning efforts in order to direct more intensive development to appropriate areas and limit development in resource areas. Well, I think um, those, that has been done particularly in um, some of the areas that are right next to downtown, like the BN zoning district. Um, we used to have a different zoning down on Main Street in the vicinity of the depot, and a number of years ago that was uh, changed to BN, which is business neighborhood, and that allows more of a use of, um, a mixture of uses of residential use and small businesses. So that's an example of more intensive development, but maintaining um, some of the character of uh, the surrounding development. And we're hoping that the um, new Amherst Media Building with their new design will, will fit into that area. So I, I have questions about like the projects that have generated intense emotion and involvement have been places like the retreat and then of course, mm -hmm. you know, Strawberry Fields on Southeast Street. And so I wonder about the other side of that equation, like there's a lot of zoning of subdivisions or whatever, you know, the PERD that was on Southeast Street or the retreat that is intensive development in really a woods or a farm and we're supposed to be protecting our natural resources and our farms. So are there places that you would say, oh, we need to, you know, I guess the expression is down zone or reduce the density of development in areas that aren't currently developed that are outside the village centers. And so I'm always wondering like, where in the map are those spots? Because you know, a lot of people move into an area and they're next to all these great fields or forests and they think, oh, I'm safe, you know, and they're really not. And then, then the question, this is suggesting those aren't appropriate areas for development that you wouldn't wanna have you know, a, a luxury resort for students ever, in my opinion, but anyway. <laughs> um, but that, you know, maybe that's not a good spot. Why was the zoning there or that allowed that? So I think the retreat was defeated by zoning. I think the fact that it didn't, um, it couldn't fit the zoning bylaw the way it was originally proposed, and then when it actually did meet the zoning bylaw, it was a, a big, I don't want to use the language that I'm thinking of, but it was not suitable at all to the location in terms of grading and blasting and filling, and it just was not a good use of that property. So I think it kind of, Mm -hmm. um, imploded on its own as a result of not being able to meet the zoning bylaw in a reasonable manner. So I also wanted to, um, there's one other thing, one other thought that I had about that. Uh, yes, I know. Um, so Van Kaner came to town meeting in the spring of 2018 with a proposal to down zone parts of North Amherst. And his proposal wasn't exactly completely thought out. He did most of it on his own and he did um, consult you know, some hydrologists and soil scientists and people, but I think um, the planning board has every intention to go back to that uh, proposal that he made and seriously look at um, rezoning that area because they realize that uh, the current zoning really isn't suitable given the underlying soil conditions um, and we probably need something what we have is 30,000 square foot zoning up there. Um, Van Kaner was proposing 80,000 square foot zoning, so the planning board is thinking maybe there's something in between that, um, a larger than, maybe, maybe an acre is reasonable. So anyway, those are the kinds of things that um, we can think about to um, rezone to develop in areas more, appropriate in, more appropriately in areas outside of the downtown. Um, let's see, create incentive zoning with bonuses for well-designed infill redevelopment. We do not do that. Um, we do have some incentives for creating affordable cluster developments, but that really doesn't relate to design at all. So, we're, so we're ha we haven't done anything with E. Uh, provide incentives, including density bonuses, to encourage energy efficient development. We haven't really done that either. Establish programs to encourage economic development in existing developed areas. Well, we do have the Opportunity Zone in um, North Amherst that was uh, recently established. So um, there is some activity in North Amherst based on this new Opportunity Zone that we have up there. And that was an application that the Planning Department put in and um, we did achieve that designation. Um, we'll, we'll have to see if it comes to fruition. 
Um, provide incentives to encourage infill and redevelopment. Um, well, I, I was talking to you a little about, it's not really incentives, but it's a new way of um, interpreting the zoning bylaw that allows uh, more infill in inner neighborhoods closer to the downtown. Well, I'm sorry, what number are you? I'm um, on H, L-U-1-H, provide incentives to encourage infill and redevelopment. I can't think of any incentives that we provide. Ex well, we do provide the tax incentive oh, for affordable units, but we don't really provide um, what I think of as incentives for infill and redevelopment. My, my LU1H says something different. Oh, it does? Oh, it does. Yeah. Huh. That's my. So I'm not looking at the matrix, I'm looking J. at the actual. Yeah, I'm too looking at plan, not the matrix. Oh, you're looking at the plan, not the matrix. Interesting. But so they the matrix should be the same. disagrees with the plan? I didn't realize that. Let's redo the master plan. <laughs> yeah. It's <Okay>. worthless. <laughs> but just about what the plan says under H, what we were looking at is create mechanisms for transfers of development rights, TDRs, from key resource areas and agricultural lands to village centers, downtown, and other specific districts and neighborhoods where denser development is more appropriate. Okay, I, ha I have that as 1J on the matrix. Yeah, I have it as 1J also. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yeah, discrepancy, well, that was, that's something that could be fixed during the update. <laughs> So you don't have the one uh, The land use uh, for land use one ends with H. There is no I or J. Huh. So there is a difference between ah. the matrix and the. So these don't exist in the report. Okay, that's good to know. How would you get to look at the matrix? How do you Could get to look at it? I it's in the last <coughs> chapter, it's chapter 10. You have chapter 10. It's a good cheat seat, cheat seat, sheet, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I just find it interesting that we find all of a sudden that the differences between the plan and the matrix. Right, yeah. Yeah, after 10 years. If you need to wait for someone to slip some additional stuff that we can't ah. <laughs> Yeah, this is that, uh -huh. Wasn't edited very well, I guess. So um, you want to move along yes. to create vital downtown and village centers. I'll start using the text, the main text from now on, um, including retail, commercial, and residential elements that are walkable, attractive, and efficient. I think one of the things we've done is we've helped to create the bid. The town manager, um, former town manager, worked very closely with um, the business community to create the business improvement district, and I think that's gone a long way to creating a vital downtown. Um, we've also hired an economic development director, and that is also um, helping us to maintain our vital downtown. Okay, now I'm lost. Oh, this is on we're on page um, three point seven. Seven. And so it's really the probably, probably the probably the strategies are what we should focus on. Strategies: change yeah. zoning to allow denser residential occupancy near existing services and public transit. So we're working on a forty R overlay district. Um, we've had a couple of public forums about that already, and that does just what it says here. It uh, creates denser residential development near existing services and public transit. And the tweaking of the zoning code to raise the number of stories That's was correct. a direct yeah. result of this also. So we've allowed five stories instead of four in the downtown. Um, encourage increased upper floor residential development in downtown and village centers to support a vital economic social setting. So we took away the lot area requirement per dwelling unit and that went a long way to allowing development of downtown properties. Previously there had been a lot area requirement for each dwelling unit in the downtown and that just didn't make sense. Um, so we've done that and we've also increased, as uh, Mr. Shriver said, increased the uh, number of floors that are allowed in the downtown. Um, support development of live work spaces, artist lots, high-tech small business offices. So we haven't really um, promoted live work spaces. We did investigate this during uh, one of our planning processes. I think it might have been when we did the gateway um, 
planning process, but um, since then we have kind of not paid a lot of attention to that particular topic, although um, we do allow business use of homes, but uh, that's a little bit different from what we're talking about yeah. here. Live workspaces are really places where people live on the second floor and they have a little shop or workspace on the first floor, so we haven't quite gotten to that yet. Build a permanent farmer's market facility. Um, we had a lot of discussion about this during a development of the plan for Kendrick Park, um, and we did come up with um, a couple of models for a farmer's market there. In the end, uh, that was not included in the final plan. People felt that they didn't want to have a permanent building on Kendrick Park, so we haven't really gone back to that as, um, as, a, as something that we want to look at. Uh, I think that the farmers who um, currently use the Spring Street lot would like to have a covered space that they could use year-round, but um, we haven't figured out where that could go yet. Develop more public art in downtown and village centers. We have a public art commission that's working very hard on that, um, trying to get developers to in incorporate art into their developments and um, trying to get the town to uh, spend some money on public art in municipal buildings. Can I, can I just ask as Chris goes through, so on what uh, uh, occurred to me when you said the permanent farmer's market uh, facility, some of these items might be, do we still want to do that or not? You know, it's, yeah. so, so is that a good idea? So I don't know when you want to flag it on a, not just a where would it be, it didn't work out here, but uh, um, if we got to the point where we said we don't actually want it anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm not saying on this one we don't, mm -hmm. but it would be a question I would raise on where would we put it if we don't have a suitable place. Um, if we want it, we'd have to identify a suitable place, but it would be a question on maybe that shouldn't be in on the list and of the to-do to to list anymore, right? And here's the rub on this one is that um, we used to have the winter farmer's market mm -hmm. in the middle school which was a great thing, and maybe it came out of the master plan, I don't know, but then it moved to Hadley Most Mall. of the people were from out of town, too. Most, a yeah. lot of the customers were, were not from Amherst. It's, so it, it's, it's one, Sarah's gonna speak to you, I'm so I'm not a, a saying no to it, I'm just saying it's one that's kind of sitting here with us, no one. So I just wanted to say that when um, North Amherst was looking at being developed and we had all those lovely charrettes. I mean, it's something that came up for North Amherst as well. I would say that I think that farmers markets are not doing as well as they were, you know, 10 or 13 years ago, but um, people are growing year round a lot more now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it's shown that in areas where there is a specific space for a farmers market, they also can double as entertainment venues. I mean, this is something that we sort of looked at um, obviously, there's a lot of issues with the farmer's market that we would want to take a look at and revisit. We want to support, you know, Amherst farmers first, yada, yada. But it might be something that we see if people still do have an interest in because, you know, we're talking about the dog park and the dog park being public art. Farmer's markets, the, uh, you know, year round are actually the plans that other people have or things that other people have done have actually been uh, similar in the fact that they have value as entertainment venues or places for people to meet or public art. I, I would throw some support. I, I love the farmer's market, especially in the winter when I remember just coming out of like five foot feet of snow and finding people and it, you know, there was music, there was food and it was a nice way to see people in the winter. And I've always thought it was really sort of tragic that the our farmer's market is bustling and full of food at the time of year when there's the fewest people in town. And so you know, the public markets that are permanent in different, I don't know if this is an urban model, but they're really doing well and they draw a lot of tourists and visitors from other communities who come in for the produce and the food and just the vibrancy of it. And then just a time check, we have about another five minutes. And so I think trying to get through as far much as possible. But yeah, so I think that's a really great point that Kathy brought up. Is that something that we should ask the AgCom if they're still interested in doing? Well, and it, it, it also just with Sarah's comment is if it was an expanded vision that it's a dual purpose that it can be, you know, it can be used. You know, so I'm just, the question was it may be 
sitting on a table not done anything because it hasn't been conceptualized quite in a way mm -hmm. that would make it exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so public art, I think we're done with that. Um, use downtown green spaces more intensively. Add, adding play spaces to encourage people of all ages to congregate. So it just so happens that we just applied for a park grant to build a playground in Kendrick Park. So we're hoping that that comes about and we'll find out about that in the fall. Um, create music, dance, and meeting venues in downtown. So we talked about the group that has been working on creating a music venue in the old fire station. I don't know if they've gotten any traction with town government, but they're a private group that's very interested in when that fire station is vacated, turning it into a venue. Um, promotes, pr promotes sustainable tourism in Amherst. I think the bid and the chamber have been uh, trying to do that, and um, you know there has been some effort on the part of the town to um, sell itself as a tourism destination. Um, that was particularly true when John Musanti was um, the town manager. I don't know if the town managers subsequently have grabbed onto that idea, but that's something that we could go back and, and talk about. Tony, Tony Marulis, I don't know what he's doing now, but he was working, he said a lot of the UMass students wanted to see more music downtown and more art spaces. And um, I think he was working on like sort of creating that. I mean, he was doing, he has a position at UMass and that the students like really wanted that to come downtown for different like openings and things like that, so. Should we keep going or is this a good stopping place? This might be a good stopping place, but one thing I was gonna mention and I'm looking for it as we Scrolling through, is there anything here about a grocery store or the co-op? Because we talked about the farmer's market. When, yeah, when this was written, was Louis still downtown? No. No? no. Mm -hmm. It had already disappeared. Yeah. It disappeared in the 80s. There is no point. <laughs> well, I did, that would be, yay, something missing then. Yeah. <laughs> then um, create. That could be an economic development, I'm not sure. Could be. Or it could be a, not a downtown issue, yeah. but I think it's a downtown issue. So we just spent a half an hour going through these yep. um, strategies, and I think we've had some pretty good comments yeah. and discussions. I agree. I so think we could. Maybe we could spend half an hour uh, at your meetings and do this? Or? So actually, I was looking at our syllabus, which we never got to, and we do have for our next meeting, two weeks from now, continued discussion of the master plan. Yeah. Do you want to continue to go yeah. through the yep. list? Okay. And we don't have the dog park. So we could spend all two hours. Okay. And Dave will be back. Uh, Sarah. Is it possible, like, when we talk about this again, that we talk a little bit about, like, where the master plan um, put village centers? And I know in North Amherst, the village center, it moved. Like, it just in some thought about, like, in the future, could, if, if it, you, you have a, a village center and it's been infilled, but then like further down the road, you don't like just what the what the general ideas are about what makes a village center and, and whether those are flexible and then they can be moved in the future. Just a, just a question because it, it happened in North Amherst. I just think it's interesting. So I did bring a map of the land use policy that goes with the master plan. So the next time we can talk about that. And I think the village centers are flexible. They're not you know defined in a very hard manner where. We know exactly where the edges are, and as things um, as things become um, proposed, the village center can expand to accommodate them. But that depends on whether the town wants that to happen or not. Could could I just um, I'm going to come next time. So it, I, I like that combination. If if you could also cross reference when you write a strategy plan, and each of these are a focused target, one may not needs to be linked to another part, but is not necessarily. So when in a village center vision, how you get around. Um, so the complete streets vision, transportation, that we don't necessarily control the development of that. The developer controls the development of their development. <laughs> but it changes the context of the whole village center if you plunk something very large in without saying, oh, these streets were originally horse and carriage streets. Should this street be wider than it is right now? And so how, how and where in town can that kind of thinking? So 
on planning board, could you have said Coles has to be a wider street, or is that beyond, you know, do you not have the tool to do that? So I just like that kind of a discussion that if you want to have this here, the street has to be wider because we need a two-sided sidewalk. What? <laughs> yeah. Well, two cars to go through oh, is, gonna be, is now the challenge. One car and one bicycle today couldn't get through. <laughs> but, but I'm just thinking, so it's, it's with streets, but over here it's the development side, and then the incentive side, and then the sewage side. And then Andy brought up affordable for the town. I mean, the net yield starts to be smaller the more we have to spend a lot of money to get something. So just some way the dots connect in a planner, with a planner mind. So that's a really good point. Um, we attempt to keep on top of those things by attending um, the Transportation Advisory Committee meetings and knowing what's going on with them and making suggestions, but the planning board doesn't have jurisdiction over the roads in town, so planning board would have to take the initiative to say to town council, hey, look, this road really needs to be wider to accommodate this development. So probably more communication is the thing that we need to do. Because I'm thinking we're planning to have a bit more power because then you're able to look at, a, you know, if it's part of the plan that we're looking at, you know, these, you know, walking and biking and traffic mm -hmm. and greenways, and it gives you more of a, a chance to actually have input. Mm -hmm. So let's wrap up. To be continued. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? Not yet. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> What's happening with um, the percent for art? We're supposed to be discussing that, and it hasn't happened. What, what happened at finance? I, I can give you one piece of information on that, on finance. So you can sure. say what happened at finance, but then I was asked to do something that will... I think come to the next town council. Do you want to speak? Go ahead. So we had a discussion of it, and the question was, what happens next? Because we just be, had a beginning discussion, and there was a request for work group. Could a work group be formed? So Lynn asked for a draft of what it might look like. Bill Kazin and I then drafted it, and I believe it was going to come before the council on August 19th. And so, and I thought it was going to be shared with you all because the way it was drafted is one person from CRC, one person from finance, um, a couple, you know, the arts council and someone from the town. So a five person to take a look at the issues that have been erased and come back with a revision. So that's the way the informal work group was set up, Pat. And since... Yeah, so, and I can send you a draft of that because all we were asked is just draft something so that. Right, which I appreciate. I guess yeah. what I'm concerned with, this goes back to liaisons, and if it, we need the information flowing from finance when it's going to, because we need to, as soon as possible, I guess, so that we can keep moving ahead. Yeah, I, I think that we need to be cautious. Um, because we are looking at three different pieces that need to be considered together and not separately. One is the benefits of percent for art, which is actually was talked about a little bit in our discussion and review of the master plan. The second is the financial cost of it, and the third is what are the, um, the rewrite of a bylaw would look like. And all three are part of it. The reason for a working group is to try and bring it all together and to allow that to happen. The um, concern that uh, the Art Commission has is that if we get too far down the line on building a building without um, having reached a conclusion that they may miss an opportunity, that's what their fear is. I don't know that we're that close on any of our proposals at this point. The other thing is, is that as far as the cost consequence is concerned, we really didn't get into it because I think that we need to be working with um, our finance staff to do this, but we really have to figure out what is going to be the cost for each of the buildings and where that cost would be paid so that information is before the council because 
if it is a building that is going to come from debt exclusion override, then you're going to uh, be increasing the amount of the debt exclusion override by the half percent um, because you're going to be presuming that you have tried to make the uh, building as cost effective to build as possible so that there isn't extra room in there, you add to it. Um, if it is a building that is being built without a debt exclusion override, it comes out of other capital and you get into the same principle and uh, the question is how much are you reducing capital available for other needs including roads and sidewalks and that again is something that we need our professional staff to help advise us on and uh, so we're not quite there because I think it's a lot more complex problem than uh, some people have hoped it would be. Can I help? Me? <laughs> okay. I need to get drink. Okay. Second? Second. All in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All opposed? So as you